Hello everyone, welcome back to our online Rooted session, Rooted Youth Meeting for this Wednesday night. I hope that you were all able to gather with us for our online video conference call through GoToMeeting earlier today. It was awesome, there was a great game, there is great discussion and a great lesson. This is the same lesson just in case you missed it. So if you're at that conference call, you don't have to watch this. If you weren't there, I would strongly encourage you to pay attention to Text me about any questions you have, talk about these things with your family, so we can all continue to grow during this time. And as we're in uncharted waters and unprecedented times with what's going on in our world, I really, really hope you know that you're not alone. I keep on saying this, and I'm going to continue to say it. I'm here for you, Stephen's here for you, our church is here for you, God is here for you, and no one is going anywhere. We are here for you. So just let us know how we can best minister to you during this time. Text us your prayers, your concerns, anything we can do for you. We're here for you and we want to help in whatever way we can. And during this time, as we get started with our lesson for tonight, it's really hard to think about that Easter is right around the corner, coming up really quickly. And I personally don't like that we might not be able to gather together and a whole lot of people don't like that either. But we're going to do the best we can. But it's still hard to believe that Easter is coming. So, what you can do is, what is your favorite Easter tradition? If you want to text me that, call me and let me know. Please do. I would love to hear from you about what's your favorite thing that your family does on Easter. For me personally, I loved the family Easter egg hunts we used to do. My parents would hide stuff around the house. We'd have a bunch of small eggs with like small Tootsie Rolls and candy. And then we'd have one big basket for each of us. My sister would have one, I would have one, and my younger brother would have one. And it was just a lot of fun being able to see all this stuff. And then of course, I always loved going to church when I was um, a little bit older and I found my faith. But there was this one story I remember, or one time, I should say, from Easter that I remember that we were traveling to my aunt and uncle's. And this was the aunt and uncle that no one in my family really got along with, but we wanted to be close with because they were family. And during this time, it was difficult because we didn't, my family got into a fight with my aunt. And as much as we wanted to be there to support our family, I was a little kid and I just wanted to go home and play my video games and have our family Easter egg hunt. So I was sitting there thinking, why are we here? Is this even worth it for us to be here right now? And times like those are difficult, especially the times when we're asking, is it worth it? Like times when you've spent a lot of energy on something that turns out not to be worth the investment. Or times when we're going through something awful, but it ends up being worth it in the end. Because when we have to endure something awful, I've always found comfort is most powerful when it comes from someone who knows what it's like, knows what you're going through. And I don't know what kind of difficulty you're all experiencing right now. I'm guessing some of it comes from being stuck at home. But maybe the difficulty is something you experience, like a tough soccer practice, a broken bone, trying to eat those extra spicy chicken wings and having your mouth go on fire. Or maybe you've been walking through something much more difficult. Rejection, stress, disappointment, sickness, loss, being stuck at home with your family. Your families are awesome, by the way. They love you. And I know this is a hard time for a lot of people, but we're in tough times. Or maybe the tough times you've experienced are pretty ordinary, but they can still be exhausting. It's like trying to navigate friend drama, get your grades up, learn a new skill. But my point is when we're experiencing something difficult, sometimes the thing we need most is comfort from someone who understands what we're going through. Because when life gets tough, it's really easy to feel alone. Like we're the only ones who've ever experienced 
what we're going through. And no one else could possibly understand it. And even though scripture and people tell us that God is with us, it can still feel like we're going through life alone. When your friends turn your back on you. When you didn't make that team, pass that test, get the job, or even win that award. Or someone says something hurtful. Or something like your family is struggling. When life is difficult, we might wonder, why would God let this happen? Should I just give up? Is all of this worth it? And this may come as a surprise to some of you. It may not come as a surprise to some, someone else, some other people in this who are listening to this. But even Jesus understands what it's like to ask these questions. Because if you've ever been around church before, you've probably heard a billion times over that Jesus died and rose again a few days later. And that's what we celebrate on every Easter and Good Friday. Before we start talking about what happened after Jesus died, though, in his resurrection, which will be next week for us, let's talk about what happened before Jesus died. Because I think Jesus has something to show us about suffering. So we're going to summarize Matthew 26. I wanted to summarize it for you because 76 verses of scripture is a lot. So I hope you enjoy this. And here we go. Jesus and his disciples were preparing for the Passover. The disciple Judas Iscariot left and sought out the high priest who paid him with 30 pieces of silver to, to betray Jesus. The twelve men became distressed and very sorrowful when Jesus confided that one of them was about to betray him. In response, each disciple asked him if he was the one who would betray him. When Judas asked it in his turn, Jesus, rep Jesus replied that it was as he said. As they were eating, Jesus blessed and distributed the bread, telling them it was his body. Taking a cup of wine, he gave thanks to God and handed the cup around, telling them to drink as it was his blood. After the meal, they left for the Mount of Olives. Jesus warned the disciples that they would fall from him that evening. Peter protested, saying that he would never fall away from Jesus. Jesus responded that Peter would disown him three times before the night was over. When they reached Gethsemane, Jesus asked his disciples to wait there while he prayed. Then he took Peter and the sons of Zebedee with him a little further. He asked them to wait and watch as he prayed. After instructing the three, Jesus walked a little farther and prayed to God to spare him if he could. He returned three times to find the disciples asleep. On the third occasion, he woke them, telling them he was about to be betrayed. As Jesus was returning from his prayers, Judas arrived with a number of armed men and kissed him, a prearranged sign. Jesus allowed himself to be arrested. When one of the disciples tried to defend him with a sword, Jesus rebuked him, saying that those who use the sword shall die by it. Furthermore, he explained that he was allowing himself to be arrested so that scripture would be fulfilled. Upon hearing this, the disciples ran away. Jesus was taken to the high priest's palace, where the scribes and elders put him on trial. Eventually, two witnesses testified that Jesus said he would tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. When asked if he was the Son of God, Jesus told them they would see him seated at the right hand of God. The high priest protested that it was blasphemy, and he, the assembled officials agreed that Jesus deserved to die, beat him, and spit on him. When Jesus was taken, Peter followed at a distance and sat in the courtyard waiting to hear the result of the trial. A servant girl recognized him as a follower of Jesus, but Peter denied it. Another servant saw him and told the onlookers that Peter was with Jesus, but again he denied it. 
When another bystander accused him of being Jesus' disciple, Peter denied it for a third time, cursing and swearing. Immediately after doing so, a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered what Jesus had told him. Therefore, he left the city and wept bitterly. Let's take a moment to go back to verses 36 to 39 here, because they are very important. They go like this. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So in this one chapter that we just summarized, Jesus experienced more suffering than most of us can probably imagine. He said goodbye to his friends, was plotted against, betrayed, let down by everyone he loved, arrested, taken to trial, sentenced to death, spit on, beaten, betrayed by two close friends, and a lot more. We might imagine Jesus in this way, but it's hard to see. It's hard to hear. Because we might imagine that Jesus walked toward death with complete peace and composure. But by the account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane can't work today, um, it tells a different story. The Bible accounts of this moment that Jesus was overwhelmed in anguish and exhausted because he happened to be under extreme stress. In the final hours before Jesus died, we see him asking, God, is there any other way? And I know if I was Jesus in this, I would be asking another question too. God, is this worth it? Is it worth this pain? And if I were Jesus, if I'm being totally honest with you, as much as it would kill me to say this, my answer would probably be no, that I don't want to die. But I don't know. I've never been in that situation. So, But not only did Jesus suffer, but many people in the first century suffered because of their faith in Jesus as well. The Roman government was threatened by Jesus' teachings, called everyone who was doing them some really ugly things that went from cannibalism to other big claims. And they were threatened by the movement that Jesus began, which meant that his followers endured all kinds of stress and oppression. And naturally, this made followers of Jesus wonder, is this Jesus guy really worth it? And many of his early followers were Jewish. Well, they were raised to follow the laws and beliefs of Judaism. They put their trust in Jesus and began to follow him. But in the face of persecution, many of them stood tall, but also many of them probably considered going back to their old ways, and some did. And that's where the book of Hebrews comes in. Hebrews was written as a letter to encourage these followers of Jesus who weren't sure of all the pain and suffering was worth it. And we don't know who wrote Hebrews, so I'll just refer to them as the author. But the author tells these followers of Jesus to stay strong, to not drift away, and to remember that Jesus understands what it feels like to suffer. So pay attention to these few verses here as you can understand a little bit about what the author of Hebrews was telling its audience and is telling us today. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, 
in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered and he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The writer says that Jesus is our high great high priest. And this is a Jewish concept that readers would have understood well. In Judaism, a high priest was someone who made sacrifices to God when people were sinful or messed up. They helped people connect to God, and they prayed to God on people's behalfs. But then we see a different way that Jesus is perceived as a high priest here for the Jewish people and followers of Christ. Jesus didn't make sacrifices. He became a sacrifice on our behalf. He gave up his own life to make a new way for us to connect with God now and forever. And Jesus also represents us before God. And the Jewish Jesus followers at this time who understood the importance of a high priest saw this as a pretty convincing argument that they should believe in Jesus. But other Christ followers weren't struggling because they needed to be convinced that Jesus was God, but because life got hard. They didn't just need a convincing argument that they needed comfort in the midst of their suffering. That's what they needed. So the writer of Hebrews pointed them back to Jesus their Savior who suffered, our Savior who suffered. The writer of Hebrews reminded them that Jesus understands what it's like to have a close friend turn their back on you, to feel like everyone hates you, to lose someone we love, to be tempted to doing something that we know is wrong, to be rejected, and to hurt so much that we start to question God. The writer of Hebrews told the early followers of Christ, and us too, to hang on, to remember that Jesus knows what it's like to suffer, and to know that Jesus is with us in whatever difficulty we face. And we've already said that comfort matters more when it comes from someone who understands what we're going through. And if that's true, that I think Jesus can understand our suffering better than anyone ever possibly can. Because he understands suffering better than anyone. And when life gets hard, one of these reasons we can't hold firmly to Christ is because he understands everything we're going through. And he's with us every step of the way. So is it worth it? When Jesus stared death, torture, and humiliation in the face, he decided, yes, that you, you are worth it. And if following Jesus ever gets hard and exhausting, and it will, the author of Hebrews says that, yes, Jesus is worth it too. Life isn't easy. Life will never be easy. And following Jesus isn't easy either. There might be one day when you want to give up, but on those days, I hope you remember that God is with you and that God understands you. And God empath emphasizes with you his empathy, not sympathy. Because the Jesus who suffered, suffers with you. And that leads us to Good Friday. Good Friday is the day we remember the suffering Jesus endured for us. It's a day of grief. But it can also be a day of comfort if we remember that we are loved by God, who doesn't just understand our pain in theory, but in experience. 
doesn't matter how extreme your sufferings are or aren't, Jesus understands. Because Good Friday reminds us we're not alone. Because Jesus suffered deeply, so there's no suffering that he can't understand. Good Friday reminds us we can go to God with our sufferings. No matter how small or insignificant they feel or how big they feel, we can tell God what happened and any questions that we have. And Good Friday also reminds us to comfort others. When we reflect on the ways that Jesus suffered. Sometimes it makes us compassionate or concerned about the suffering of others. Good Friday should be a time where you ask God to help you to be a comfort to those who are suffering. Because Jesus suffered. And he suffers with you. So no matter what you're feeling, if you're disappointed, stressed out, lonely, afraid, Jesus knows what it's like. So what if, instead of asking God, why did you let this happen to me? What if we asked Jesus, what did you feel when this was going? When did you feel this way? So this Good Friday, as it's coming up really quick, I hope you remember that we can't avoid pain, but there is a real person who understands. Jesus knows how you feel. And his heart breaks when yours is breaking. And sometimes there's no greater comfort in the midst of pain than knowing someone gets it. That doesn't mean we can't comfort others when they're going through something we don't understand. We can still be there for them. But it's still incredible to know that Jesus suffered and suffers with you now. And on Good Friday, and in this time with COVID-19, or as, some, as I call it sometimes too, the coronavirus. That's really good news. It means we're not alone. That no matter what we're going through, Jesus went through it too. And Jesus is with you. So please, as we finish today with this last statement, please know I'm here for you. I may not know what you're going through entirely, but I love you. And whatever you need, just reach out to me. I'll do whatever I can and whatever is in my power to help you in any way I can. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And I look forward to meeting again with you as soon as we possibly can. As always, here are some questions for you to go over with your family, with your friends, or with me if you need to. I strongly encourage you to talk about these questions, to talk about today's discussion that we had on Easter and Good Friday and how Christ suffers with us. I hope you are all well, you're safe, and you're healthy. Know once again that I'm praying for you, and I'm not going anywhere. Hope you're all having a great week. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you soon.